Hello and welcome to 16.3. More on Darwin and how he got to these geniuses' ideas that he had about evolution. So our goal is to describe how scientific inferences are drawn from scientific observation. And the far side has nothing to do with it at all. I thought it was cute though. All right, let's look at our objectives then. Our objectives are to identify the conclusions drawn by Hutton and Lyell about Earth's history, describe Lamarck's hypothesis of evolution, and describe Malthus's view of population growth. I like to call him gloom and doom, Malthus. Finally, explain the role of inherited variation of artificial selection. All right, let's think about it. So Darwin voyaged on the HMS Beagle, came to one of the most exciting periods in the history of science, came during this. Geologists studied the structure of the history of Earth, were making new observations about the forces that shape our planet. Naturalists were investigating connections between organisms and their environments, and these and other new ways of thinking about the natural world provided the foundation on which Darwin built his ideas, how he got his inferences. So our first objective is to identify the conclusions drawn by these two scientists, Hutton and Lyell, about the Earth's history. And here they are. By Darwin's time, the relatively new science of geology, I think this is Hutton, and that's Lyell, I do believe, uh, was providing evidence to support new and different ideas about the Earth's history. Geologists James Hutton and Charles Lyell formed an important hypothesis based on the work of other researchers and on evidence they uncovered themselves too. Hutton and Lyell concluded the Earth is extremely old and that the process that changed Earth in the past the same processes that operate in the present. That's pretty much in a nutshell, you guys, right there. But we're going to go in a little more details about these guys. So Hutton recognized the connections between a number of geological processes and geological features, like mountains and valleys and layers of rocks that seem to be bend or fold. He realized, for example, that certain kinds of rocks are formed from molten lava. Hutton also realized that some other kind of rocks are formed very slowly as sediments build up and are squeezed into layers. The rock layers of the Grand Canyon were laid down over millions of years ago and were then washed away by the river, forming a channel. Hutton also proposed that processes beneath the Earth's surface can push the rock layers up, as you can see the picture here, mountain layers, tilting or twisting them in the process and eventually forming mountain ranges. Mountains, in turn, can be worn down by wind, heat, and rain, and cold. And since most of these processes operate very slowly, Hutton concluded that our planet must be much older than a few thousand years. So he introduced this concept called deep time. Yeah. The idea that a planet's history stretches back over a period of time so long it is difficult for the human mind to even think of. This explained all his reasonings and how these rock formations occurred. Moving on to Lyell. Lyell presented a way of thinking called uniformitarianism. This is the idea that geological processes we see in action today must be the same ones that shaped Earth millions of years ago. Ancient volcanoes released lavas and gases just as volcanoes do now. Ancient rivers slowly dug channels and carved canyons in the past just as they do now. Lyell's theories, like those of Hutton, relied on there being enough time in Earth's history for these changes to take place. And like Hutton, Lyell argued that Earth was much much older than a few thousand years. Otherwise, how would a river have enough time to carve out a whole valley? The woodcut that you see here from Lyell's Principles of Geology shows geological features near Italy's Mount Etna. Among them is a deep channel, it's labeled B right here, a deep channel um, carved into a bed of lava. Lyell's work helped Darwin appreciate the significance of an earthquake he witnessed in South America. The earthquake that Darwin experienced was so strong that it lifted a stretch of rocky shoreline more than three meters, that's quite a bit, out of the sea, with mussels and other sea animals were still clinging to it. Sometime later, Darwin also observed fossils of marine animals and mountains thousands of feet above the sea levels. So you can see how these two scientists, with their ideas, had a huge influence on Darwin's thinking of evolution, biological evolution. So objective one is identify the conclusions drawn by Hutton and Lyle about Earth's history. Hutton and Lyle concluded that Earth is extremely old and the processes that change the Earth in the past are the same processes that operate in the present. 
Let's look at Lamarck's hypothesis of evolution. This guy was a forward thinker, obviously. He wasn't afraid to say what he was thinking, but he wasn't entirely right either. All right, let's look at this guy. That's, that's a picture of Lamarck right there. So Darwin wasn't the first scientist to, to suggest that characteristics of species could change over time. And that was kind of huge for this guy, Lamarck. And I give him some credit there because in the, this day and age, God made everything just the way it was and everything's perfect. Nothing's going to change because that's the way God made it. And God mainly makes perfect things, right? Lamarck was going, hmm, maybe not. So it did have an influence on Darwin's thinking. Throughout the 18th century, a growing fossil record supported the idea that life somehow evolved. They were finding fossils everywhere, but ideas differed about just how the life evolved. So in 1809, the French naturalist Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck proposed a hypothesis that organisms could change during their lifetimes by selectively using or not using various parts of their bodies. Hmm, think about that one. He also suggested that individuals could pass these acquired traits on to their offspring, enabling species to change over time. That's like saying, uh, I don't want to use my arm, I'm going to lose my arm, and then my children won't be born with arms. Lamarck proposed that all organisms have an inborn urge to become more complex and perfect, and to change and acquire features that help them to live more successfully in their environments. Not exactly, otherwise you'd all get A's on everything. Well, maybe you do. Lamarck thought that organisms could change the color, the size or shape of their organs by using their bodies in new ways. For example, this um, black-necked stilt right here, black-necked stilt, could have acquired the long legs because it began to wade in deeper water looking for food. And as the bird tried to stay above the water surface, its legs would actually grow a little longer. Eh, not exactly. Structures of individual organisms could also change if they were not used. If a bird stopped using its wings to fly, for example, its wings would become smaller. Traits altered by an individual organism during its life are called acquired traits. Lamarck also suggested that a bird that acquired a trait, like longer legs during its lifetime, could pass that trait on to its offspring, a principle referred to as inheritance of acquired characteristics. Thus, over a few generations, birds like the black-necked stilt could evolve longer and longer legs. Today, we know that Lamarck's hypotheses were incorrect in several ways. Organisms don't have an inborn drive to become more perfect. Evolution does not mean that over as time a species becomes better somehow. And evolution does not progress in a predetermined direction. In addition, traits acquired by individuals during their lifetime cannot be passed on to offspring. However, Lamarck was one of the first naturalists to suggest that species were not fixed, not not changing. He was among the first to try to explain evolution scientifically using natural processes, and he also recognized that there is a link between an organism's environment and its body structure. So he was a forward thinker in that, that respect, but a little bit backwards in what he thought. All right, so Lamarck's hypothesis of evolution he suggested that organisms could change during their lifetimes by selectively using or not using various parts of their bodies. And he also suggested that individuals could pass these acquired traits on to their offspring, enabling the species to change over time. Let's look at objective three. Describe Malthus's view of population growth. Gloom and doom, this guy. So in 1798, English economist Thomas Malthus was looking out of his window and noticed that there's a population crowding going on in London. He noted that humans were being born faster than people were dying, causing this overcrowding. This 19th century engraving right here, as you can see, all right, shows the crowded conditions in London's during Darwin's time. The forces that worked against the population growth Malthus suggested included war, famine, and, and disease. He, was, he said that only war, famine, and disease is the only thing that's going to stop people from populating. He reasoned that the human population grew unchecked, there wouldn't be enough living space, for, and food for everyone. Hence, you'd get war, famine, and disease. Darwin realized that Malthus's reason applied even more to other organisms than it did to humans. For example, an oak tree can produce thousands of seeds each summer. One oyster can produce millions of eggs each year. However, most offspring die before reaching maturity, and only a few of those that survived managed to reproduce. Darwin had become convinced that species evolved but he needed a scientific explanation based on natural processes to explain 
how and why evolution occurred. So when Darwin realized that most organisms don't survive and reproduce, he wondered which individuals survived and why. All right, so objective three, describe Malthus's Mr. Gloom and Doom. Malthus reasoned that the human population grew unchecked, there wouldn't be enough living space and food for everyone, and only war, famine, and disease would stop us from taking over. All right, explain the role of inherited variation in, in artist, artificial and selection. Moving on now, guys. To find an explanation for change in nature, Darwin studied change produced by plant and animal breeders. Breeders knew that individual organisms vary and that some of these variations could be passed from parents to offspring and used to improve crops and livestock. For example, farmers would select for breeding only trees that produce the largest fruit or cows that produce the most milk. And over time, this selective breeding would produce trees with even bigger fruit and cows with even more milk. Darwin called the selective breeding process artificial selection, a process in which nature provides the variations and humans select those they find useful. Darwin put artificial selection to the test by raising and breeding plants in these fancy pigeons varieties you see here. I like this one the best. Anyhow, Darwin had no idea how hereditary worked or what caused heritable variation, but he did know that variation occurs in wild species as well as domesticated plants and animals. Before Darwin, scientists thought variations among individuals and natures were simply minor defects. Darwin recognized that natural variation was very important because it provided the raw material for evolution. So when Darwin published his scientific explanation for evolution, it changed the way people understood the living world. Here's another example. You could come in wild mustard and you can do all kinds of things with it. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Kohlrabi, whatever that is, uh, how do you say that? Kale. I love kale. So, objective four, explain the role of inherited variation in artificial selection. In artificial selection, nature provides the variations, and humans select those they find most useful. So, to reiterate here, our objectives identify the conclusions drawn by Hutton and Lyle about Earth's history. Don't forget those two, deep time and uniformitarianism. Describe Lamarck's hypothesis of evolution. He had some good points and some bad points. And describe Malthus's view of population growth, Mr. Gloom and Doom. Explain the role of, um, and, and finally explain the role of inherited variation artificial selection. Think that breeders do. Our goal was to describe how scientific inferences are drawn from scientific observations. I hope you can see how all these scientists, Hutton, Lyle, Lamarck, and Malthus's, help contribute to Darwin's way of thinking of evolution. Have a good evening. Oh, do I have a cute picture? And I do. It's a giraffe. <laughs>